Okay. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us. We are really excited to have you. My name is Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. And uh, we are here today to talk about climate change and the atmosphere and systems change, which you all are interested in. So we're excited to do uh, this, another one of our quarterly webinars on information uh, regarding climate change, resilience, and the work of the Waterfront Alliance. So I'm going to do a quick introduction about us and then I'll be introducing our speakers. So uh, next slide. The Waterfront Alliance inspires, affects uh, resilient, revitalize, and, and accessible coastlines for all communities in New York and New Jersey. Next slide. Um, we do this through outreach and education, through our conference and programs with middle schools and high school students by getting people on the water, pushing for and supporting waterborne transit, and working to influence policy, laws, and regulations. One of the major focuses of the Waterfront Alliance is responding to the climate crisis. Next slide. And we are also an alliance of more than 1,100 organizations, businesses, nonprofits, volunteer groups, and corporations, all of whom are committed to supporting the mission of the Waterfront Alliance and working in one way or another for the revitalization and protection of our waterfronts and coastlines. Next slide. So today we'll be talking about, and we'll be hearing from uh, one of the leading scientists in atmospheric chemistry to tell us what is going on right now. And then we'll be talking a bit about the importance of systems change. And then we'll jump into some of the specific examples of the way that the Waterfront Alliance is working on systems change. And so um, we'll first hear from Dr. Roshin Kaman who is Assistant Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. And then I will speak, and then our Vice President of Programs, Karen Imus, will take it over. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Dr. Kaman, who will share her slides. And we're really excited to have you. Thank you for being with us today. Sure, no problem. Happy to be here. Now, you think after a year of Zoom, I'd be better at this, but let's see how this goes. Great. Now, can you see slides? Yes. So, great. Um, so good morning. Um, my name is Roshin Kaman. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia, and I'm out currently at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at the moment. Um, and today I'm just going to briefly give you kind of an overview of kind of the urban contributions to climate change that you see from discussed in the IPCC and then on to what we see in New York City itself. Um, so the picture I have here on the left is kind of a good way of thinking about how all of this is connected. We're looking at emissions from cities that get blown around the world and will impact places like the Arctic. Now I do, I do research in all of these areas and it's become quite evident to me how really connected they are, but let me walk you through some of the, the science I've been doing that has kind of gotten me to that point. So 2020 and 2016 are tied as the warmest years on record, and July 2021 was also record breaking. So it's very likely that 2021 will just surpass both of those as we go along. And climate change is one of those things that we all hear about, but what does it actually mean? Um, so I'm Irish. Um, our former president of Ireland is uh, one of the human rights ambassadors now um, for the UN. And one of her quotes is that climate change is the greatest threat to human rights in the 21st century. And I can see where she's coming from on that one. Um, we need greenhouse gases for the earth to survive, but we only need a certain amount to keep the temperature what we would like it to be. So on the left here is a picture of what the January to December 2021 temperatures look like around the world compared to what they were in the 1950s to 80s. And what you can see is that the warming that we've been talking about with, oh, it's the warmest year on record, it's not happening uniformly. A lot of that warming is happening in, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. It's being pushed into areas that they're not the ones that are emitting, emitting the gases that are leading to the warming. And the Arctic in particular is warming twice as fast, but even there it's not uniform. It's yes, their summers are getting hotter, but their winters aren't getting as cold. And that has a huge impact on permafrost based infrastructure, whether or not they can keep things cold during the winter, um, how soils are freezing. Um, and that's the kind of research I've been doing in the Arctic a lot. 
Um, most of the greenhouse gases we're going to talk about are carbon dioxide, methane, and N2O. Now, carbon dioxide isn't the strongest greenhouse gas, but there, it's, there's just huge amounts of that. So if we're looking at um, concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, CO2 warms by taking in, you get light coming in from the sun, it hits the earth and it converts to heat energy. And the CO2 absorbs that heat energy as it would go back out to space again. If we just had a blank rock, we just have it, if it was like a mirror ball, it would bounce off and straight back out. But because it changes to heat energy, the CO2 absorbs that. Now we need that. We're too far from the sun to stay warm enough for human life to be there but we only need a certain amount of it. And there's a very good long-term record at Mauna Loa in Hawaii measuring CO2. And there are two different things you can kind of see here. The black line is the kind of annual increase that we see, and that's driven by the anthropogenic emissions. So cars, transportation, um, construction, concrete manufacture, all that kind of stuff. But then on top of that, we have the wiggles. We have the plant uptake, and this particular site sees an integrated signal from the whole of the Northern Hemisphere in summer. So it sees the CO2 go up in the winter, and the, the biosphere and the oceans take up a huge amount of the CO2 um, through the summertime. Now, the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 100 years, and it really has the biggest impact on climate because the concentrations are so huge. We're talking about if you have um, a parcel of air one in 400 out of every million particles in that air are CO2. That's a huge amount volume wise. So the growth rate, this is on the um, Mauna Loa CO2 observatory, looking at the growth rate on top of that. And we've been seeing it increase over the more recent years. So when we're talking about emissions, we're seeing that the emissions are accelerating. When we're talking about curbing the emissions, we're still talking about emitting CO2 just at a slightly slower increase rate slightly less than last year, but we're still emitting a lot. And what you'll notice is 2020, we were all talking about COVID. The numbers are still pretty high, even for, a, even for half the world shutting down for weeks and months at a time, we're still emitting an awful lot of CO2. For methane, um, we're also seeing that kind of continuous growth, but it went through a very different behavior. The records start in 1983, and that's looking at an increase in methane, and then it kind of leveled off. And then since 2007, it started increasing, and 2015, it just started rocketing up even more. And this year was the largest increase we've ever seen in methane. Now, there's a seasonal cycle to it also, so you get the emission, but then it gets destroyed in the summertime in not the same way it's taken up by the biosphere, but in this case, the atmosphere destroys the methane. And methane has about a 10 year lifetime in the atmosphere, but it absorbs 80 times the same amount of heat as CO2 over a 20 year time period. So it eventually dies away. Um, and I like this, this picture in the bottom right. It's one of those pictures that it's become kind of a running joke in the methane community. You have cows in a wetland beside an oil rig. So there's an oil rig in the background of that picture. And that's three of the major methane sources all in one go. Now, we don't know exactly what's driving the, the most recent massive increase in methane. You can see here, it's still a topic of discussion in the community, but there are certain things we can rule out and I'll come to that in a moment. Now, when we're talking about methane, that's one observatory in the middle of the Pacific, but what does it look like if we're looking at the whole world? So I've been doing a lot of um, projects looking at the interhemispheric gradient. So what does it look like if you fly from the North Pole to the South Pole and measure methane and CO2 along the way? And on the right hand side here is from May 2018, and it's a slice down the Pacific where we flew up and down the whole way. It's part of a NASA project called ABOVE. Um, sorry, ATOM. So it was looking at the atmospheric tomography, taking a slice out of the atmosphere. And you can see here that it's really the northern hemisphere in May has a huge amount of CO2 and the southern hemisphere we're not seeing much at all. And there's a very strong gradient, some of it driven by how the winds move at that time of year, keeping all the CO2 really like pretty tightly wound up in the northern hemisphere. Now, what you'll also see is there are massive amounts of CO2 60 to 75 degrees, and that's Northern Alaska. And they're not emitted there. These gases get pushed up to the Arctic, even though they're emitted at much lower latitudes. So they're emitted where people are, and then we move it up from there. And then looking at methane, we're um, looking at it 
same type of thing. We're seeing a huge amount in the Northern Hemisphere where the atmospheric um, emissions happen. And then some of it is getting pushed up into the Arctic also. And then there's a much stronger interhemispheric gradient because the atmosphere destroys it as it goes more towards, it's a sunlight driven destruction of methane. So as we're thinking about how all these things are connected, we're looking at the, the urban area into the Arctic. I just wanted to briefly just kind of have a quick discussion about the Arctic. So we're doing a lot of work to try and understand whether the Arctic is a net source or net sink of carbon right now, because a lot of things are really changing. Historically, it was a carbon sink. Um, the Arctic has some of the highest carbon content soils in the world, and about 50% of the global ground carbon is stored in soils in the Arctic. Now, if you were to take all that carbon and just dump it in the atmosphere, we'd have an additional 700 ppm, which is about twice what's there in the atmosphere now. We're not expecting that to happen, but the potential reservoir of carbon, if we start burning that off, there's a huge amount in that reservoir that we really would like to keep locked up in those Arctic soils. So there's a lot of discussion going on right now about whether we're going to see microbes because it's not freezing in winter, the microbes stay active a lot longer. We're seeing much longer respiration seasons. So the CO2 and methane emissions are now continuing up until December, January, when one time they would really stop hard in October. So those kind of questions are something we're working on now, but we are not seeing any evidence that the 2020 increase that we're seeing has anything to do with the Arctic emissions. There, it was very warm, but we're not seeing any evidence for that now where exactly it's coming from is still a matter of debate and tropical wetlands are being considered one of them. But that's for huge amounts of variability we get from the tropical wetlands. What's really driving the overall baseline increase is the anthropogenic, and that's what I'm gonna come back to now. So where in the world are the fossil fuel emissions happening? 70% um, of global carbon emissions are from urban areas. Those areas are only about 3% of the earth's surface, <clears throat> but between them, the US and China cover about half of global emissions. Now, if you look at this uh, graph on the right-hand side, it's the total footprint um, versus the population of a city. So taking a metro area, what's the total carbon emissions within that, that grid box? And then as a function of how big is the city? So you have places like Hong Kong that have huge emissions, but they also have a huge population. Whereas if you look at somewhere like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, the US has a lot of cities in this number and the, the population of them is large, but not as large as other cities, yet the emissions are huge. So for the New York metro area, we're talking about 20 million people. The city center itself is, you know, closer to eight. So when we're looking at New York, it's been very interesting as I'm kind of learning about everything. As you can tell, I'm not from New York. Um, the city versus the metro area. The minute you start bringing New Jersey into it, we're getting very different um, ways of accounting for inventories and everything else, which has made things quite difficult. So this is for the New York City. This is for the five boroughs. Um, carbon emissions for New York City is kind of what I'm really interested in, but not just the city, but we have information for the city. They've done a really good job trying to build up what the inventories would be. So if you were taking an accounting approach, how much CO2 is being emitted in different processes within the city. So this is for stationary energy, not looking at the, the transportation for a moment and looking at it as a function of the different fuel types. So we have things like electricity use or the yellow ones. Now by electricity use, that means that there's power plants, most of which burn natural gas until they don't, and then they rely on diesel and oil. Um, the dark green is natural gas use. So a lot of it is residential and that's home heating and water heating. Um, so there's a lot of that mainly in winter time, whereas the commercial and institutional and manufacturing, a lot of the natural gas can be also used in summertime for cooling. Um, and finding out how well these, you capture every process. Like if, if there's something missing, would we even notice? Can we observe changes as we're trying to reduce all of these emissions? Can we see this in the atmosphere? If we're actually seeing a reduction in carbon emissions, we should be able to measure that. Um, and this, the city of New York has a 0.7%. So this tiny little uh, green bit over here is what it calculates the fugitive methane leak rate to be. Now, by that it means for the total amount of natural gas that's used in the city, they assume all of it is burned and 0.7% of it is leak, leaks into the atmosphere of the city before it gets the chance to be burned. Now, 
that number is very small compared to anywhere that has measured it and compared to any other estimates. And there was been there have been a number of aircraft campaigns flying around cities on the northeast and using different methods, if you assume that we understand what the CO is doing, so carbon monoxide emissions are, if you assume what we know the CO2 emissions are, can you calculate what the methane should be? And what they're finding is that first, many cities, you know, DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, there's large emissions. Now these would be considered large emissions and then you hit New York City and it's just off the charts. And these are all older cities with older infrastructure. Boston and New York, other than the, the the number of people, the infrastructure would be pretty similar, old. There hasn't been much investment in infrastructure in either city. But what we have over on the right-hand side here is take all of those except Providence. Um, what does the EPA think the inventory should be for methane? And that's what this yellow and then a fraction of it should be natural gas emissions. And a lot of it should be wastewater treatment plants, that kind of thing, and that scaling. Whereas this study says that it should be three times higher than that and most of it should be natural gas. So that's what we're seeing in the atmosphere compared to what we think it is from the bottom up. So there's a disconnect there. Why is that that we have this disconnect? And that's what I'm going to that's what I'm focusing on. Now, when we talk about concentrations in the atmosphere, there's three different things we need to worry about when we're seeing that we have air that's blowing in from somewhere else. When we look at pollution for like NOx or ozone, ozone, we have to worry about, but NOx it doesn't survive long enough to be pushed into an area. But CO2, methane, ozone, CO, we have to worry about what's coming in. So can we blame DC? Can Connecticut blame New York? That kind of thing. We also have to worry about how much is emitted. So we have this emission flux within our city itself and how much the weather influences things. Now that's important because when we think about what happened during COVID, that's what we're gonna take it in context. So we've been making measurements in Harlem. I'm not going to spend much time on that unless people have questions. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of the impervious surface area. We're seeing a lot of air coming from the southwest. But we also have an awful lot of things to worry about in the New York metro area, not necessarily in the city. So the city has a lot of power plants all along the East River with the port. And then we have the Bayway refinery, which is the largest refinery on the East Coast, Northeast. And that's a potentially massive source of methane. So during COVID, this is where my, um, I guess, appreciation for how much can you expect people to do? We emptied the city. We emptied the city for months, really. I, I felt like I was the only one still here. Um, and everything locked down for two weeks. Our mobility was down 60 odd percent in traffic, 80% on transit. You'd often be the only person. I was the only person in a subway car. Eventually I started biking because it was just eerie. Um, and we did see there was a massive amount of um, coverage at the time. We see a huge decrease in pollution. It felt cleaner. It sounded better. The city was much more pleasant to be in. But what does that actually mean when we look at it? So we saw about a 40% drop in NO2, which is a pollutant that really affects people's respiration, your eyes, your nose. It's really can be quite dangerous to help. Um, drop of about 40% in CO. But that actually, because of the winds, we really just got lucky that the winds blew everything away. It was only a 20% change in emissions. So we take away all the traffic, we're only dropping about 20%. The methane and the CO2 were in the five to four to 5% range. So that's the kind of thing we need to keep in mind. We, everybody stayed home and we only saw a 5% drop in everything. And recently we've been having pollution events in seasons that shouldn't be pollution event seasons. So this is from March of 2021. And you can see the layer of crud coming up. Now it was the whole of the East Coast. It was a very large stagnation event. But you can, if you can see the air, something has gone wrong. And in this case, there was massive amounts of particulate matter in the air. The, P, the NO2 is at 60 ppb, that's massive. 1.3 ppm of CO, like these are, these are massively polluted numbers. And yet we were supposed to be cleaning up after COVID. So it has me thinking more about what are the actual sources of a lot of things. Personal responsibility isn't really helping. We have way more going on here. So if we're looking at burning things, so we use natural gas and burn it, it assumes we are efficiently burning it. And we're seeing some data that shows that we're seeing natural gas escaping when somebody tried to burn it. What does that mean? So some of the future thoughts, I'm trying to make sure I'm keeping on time. Um, 
we're looking at for things like CO, we've been saying it's all traffic. It's not all traffic. We're seeing an awful lot more CO pollutants like CO and NOx from things that are not traffic. We've been blaming some of the wrong things. So we're working now to try and nail down exact numbers for that. Um, the missing methane, is that related to the CO? So electric car fleets, they won't really solve the problem in New York. Initially, if we don't clean up how we're powering those cars, we could actually make things air quality wise, we could make things worse in the city. So we need to start thinking about it as a whole system together. You've got air quality and CO2, they're both related through combustion. And in cities, we need to be able to figure out how to pull those together. Um, and then a, a few bits on the Arctic stuff, if anyone has any questions, but we need to make sure that we're systematically approaching all of this in a way that doesn't allow the air quality to get worse and kill people but actually improves the air quality while we're reducing the carbon emissions. And there are ways to do that. So yeah, that was my pitch for uh, please and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Come on. I think we had some quick questions. Um, what is PPP? That's parts per billion. Yep, yep. Right. And And um, I think earlier on, there was a question of whether or not the emissions also were related to, um, to airplane emissions. Yes. So aircraft are actually surprisingly clean. So even though we've got three aircraft, most of the time it's only the on the ground taxiing and take takeoff landing that are considered in cities um, because the emissions happen somewhere else. Um, so a lot of the time you won't see that impact at the surface. Um, okay. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. I'm gonna now <clears throat> I'm going to now speak a, a bit about systems change. So us tying in um, what I'm going to talk about to what Dr. Kaman said, um, I, I'm going to be talking a bit about the importance of thinking systemically about what we need to do to, um, to both reduce emissions and prepare for the effects of climate change. So, um, all right, so great, we're sharing this slide. All right, so. Um, the, one of the emphasis, an emphasis of the Waterfront Alliance is the importance of collective action and the belief and, the, and the, what we know, which is collective action is what is needed for the large scale systemic changes that we need. And we must, that we must come together for in order to combat the climate crisis and also prepare our future for the effects of climate change. Next slide. So originally when we started this um, putting, to, putting today together, we thought we'd be talking a lot about the IPCC report, but then just two weeks ago, hurricane or two, about two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, Hurricane Ida showed us that the climate crisis is causing life, loss of life, destruction of livelihoods and economies, disruption, disruptions to urban, suburban and rural infrastructure. We are grappling with a world that is fundamentally changing in ways not known of since the evolution of Homo sapiens. So next slide. This is a frightening time. People might feel prone to despair and may think their individual actions cannot be helpful, but every single person has to understand the need for change and then take action. Collective action is what is most necessary and urgent. And as advocates, we see this as a time for clarifying purpose, pulling together, fighting for the future and working towards collective action. Next slide. So I believe there are three fundamental ways we must move forward. First, we must provide immediate disaster relief and assistance after disasters, especially for those who have lost life, lost their lives, loss of home, health impacts, or people who've lost their ability to return to work, go to school and provide for their families. The next thing we must do is do everything we can to eliminate the burning of fossil fuels. We must keep fossil fuels in the ground, period. Our climate systems are now just responding to the levels of CO2 that have not been seen for more than 3 million years. And lastly, we must make climate resilience an equal priority to emissions reductions and all its variations. We need resilient systems of distribution, governance, transportation, infrastructure, energy, and social services, just to name a few. And ultimately, it's about collective action, which is the most important thing we can do and support. And by participating in collective action, the individual can persuade and pressure government agencies and other policymakers to update policy, pass laws, change regulations, improve infrastructure, and fund resilience and adaptation faster. Next slide. And I worry that over the last few decades, we have lost the connection to the importance of collective action, even though collective action can have the greatest impact on the climate crisis. 
acting together for political change and being a force for change in our fundamental systems is the best way to bring about decarbonization and climate resilience. We each might feel responsible for our for our um, contributions to climate change. And that's because we live in a society, that's for many reasons, but one reason is that we live in a society focused on individual, achieve, individual achievement, individual responsibility, individual actions. And we have been told to take individual actions for change. We've all heard it, drive less, use energy efficient light bulbs, limit air travel, recycle, buy organic. These are all good. But the fossil fuel industry and even the environmental community have reinforced this by emphasizing the reduction of one's carbon footprint, which was actually a concept originally crafted by BP Oil. Take a look at a simple Google search for what you can do about climate change and you will find that taking action and using your voice is often not in the top of the list or there at all. Next slide. And to be fair, one of the reasons why the environmental advocacy community, and in fact, many of the major organizations working on climate change may not emphasize political action and collective action is because of the restrictions on lobbying by 501c3s. The restrictions are often reinforced by organizations and philanthropists who do not support political activity for legal reasons or for other reasons. And the extent to which 501c3s can lobby and how lobbying is defined is actually can be an entirely other talk. But if anyone's interested in specific information about those legal limits, you can find resources on places like boulderadvocacy.org. And this is because the truth is, is that 501c3s have a lot more freedom to advocate and lobby than they realize. The most important thing a person can do is be part of a larger effort to push for, push for changes in our systems and infrastructure and supporting the organizations that make collective action possible from the community volunteer group to the advocacy organization. Next slide. So a way to get involved with emissions reductions for systemic change globally and fight the end of um, fight for the end of fossil fuel emissions is to get in, it's to understand and get involved with COP26. That's the two week United Nations summit that's just coming up uh, to develop legal agreements between countries for emissions reductions. It's on October 31st, and you should tell your elected representative that you want the U.S. to work for strong legal agreements between countries to meet the standards that will keep the planet's temperature under control by limiting emissions and not increasing warming more than 1.5 degrees C or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Next slide. <clears throat> and next is to keep up with data about renewable energy in our region and support organizations such as the Waterfront Alliance that support the offshore wind industry. And that's because though we have a long way to go, our region is making strides in trans transitioning to renewable energy. Many of you may not know that the New York, New Jersey Harbor is home to some of the largest offshore wind investments in the country. And this is the result of leadership from both New York and New Jersey to maintain the Paris climate Accord commitments, even after the last president re, uh, removed the United States from those commitments. And also recent commitments from the Biden administration will increase offshore wind capacity. One of the reasons why our region is so important and good for offshore wind is that offshore wind can supply major population centers and can be centered where wind energy is high. The offshore wind industry can also be staged, maintained, and operated through the many port facilities of the New York, New Jersey Harbor. Next slide. And lastly, we must work together for systemic change for infrastructure improvements. We rely on infrastructure every day to do what we do, to have stable and functioning societies, to allow for the movement of goods, for people to engage in ec economic activity and for basic services and for energy. Our infrastructure was established at a time when we assumed that the atmosphere and the earth's water and climate systems were unchangeable. Our built systems for energy, wastewater treatment, stormwater drainage, coastal defense, you name it, were def designed for climate and atmosphere we no longer have. We are thus at a pivot point where we must build and change our infrastructure to meet the new climate reality. Next slide. And a powerful tool for collective action to change and improve our infrastructure and systems. and was started close to three years ago, officially launching last year. 
The goal of the Rise to Resilience Coalition, spearheaded by the Waterfront Alliance, is to ensure that we build and transform our communities and region to meet the challenges of climate change. Next slide. Hope you guys can still hear me. I got a little notice that my Wi-Fi was messed up. The coalition has um, gathered early victories, many of which were only possible because of, because of strength in numbers and the action and participation of our partners, coalition members, and individual supporters, and the support of philanthropy for the creation of the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So now I'm going to turn it over to Karen Imus, Vice President of Programs for the Waterfront Alliance, who will go over a few of our victories to give a sense of what we've done and also what will be possible as we build political strength for resilience to climate change. And it's a very important, these are all very, very important examples of the power of collective action. So with that, I'll pass it off to Karen. Thanks so much, Courtney. Uh, it's good to be with you all uh, this morning. Um, and I'll hone in a little bit on what the Rise to Resilience Coalition has been working on over the course of the last year since it launched in July of 2020. Courtney mentioned collective action and infrastructure, resilience and adaptation. Uh, and these are the top priorities uh, that the coalition has been focused on. We are 100 plus members strong uh, from New York and New Jersey. Um, we are three active working groups focused on New York City, New York State, policy, New Jersey policy and federal policy with active chairs helping to spearhead the work of each working group. The coalition has a website, uh, rise the number two resilience.org uh, and through its uh, extensive outreach and advocacy has been active uh, and visible in the, in the media and importantly has um, accomplished different resiliency wins at different levels of government um, since its launch last year. Uh, it is a very complicated landscape for resilience and adaptation policy because so much of this is influenced at different levels of government through different funding streams and a lot of it through regulatory and zoning changes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some of our accomplishments, and before I mention those, I should add that the, the 100 plus members of the coalition really range from um, a, a, a really a broad tent and captures uh, national uh, environmental advocates ranging from groups like Environmental Defense Fund uh, to Riverkeeper to uh, state actors uh, like the New Jersey and New York League of Conservation Voters to civic uh, and neighborhood groups uh, like Coney Island Beautification Pro uh, Project and Rise Rockaway, uh, as well as organizations involved in um, disaster response and relief. Uh, all coming together to advocate for these issues. Uh, we've been active uh, as a coalition on the Water Resources Development Act, helping to influence Army Corps reforms and expanding authorization for the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study to be a more holistic study to address sea level rise, precipitation and engage communities. Um, similarly, we're currently working through the federal budget to ensure that there's language uh, in the appropriations bills to continue funding for this study uh, and, in, and ensuring that there are community engagement efforts uh, and holistic efforts in terms of how the Army Corps undertakes this work. And we've been actively engaged as a coalition with FEMA, um, trying to influence uh, FEMA's engagement on the ground with environmental justice uh, and at-risk communities uh, when it responds to, to a storm or disaster. Next slide, please. Uh, New Jersey has been uh, very active uh, under the Murphy administration with uh, climate policy and increasingly we're seeing climate adaptation policy uh, really become front and center in New Jersey. Um, the state released a very robust climate resilience strategy that the Rise to Resilience Coalition extensively contributed to. Uh, and similarly, earlier this year, the coalition was one of the most vocal and active voices in the municipal land use legislation that was signed by the Murphy administration, which um, is going to have a real on the ground impact in terms of how municipalities are adopting master plan updates and having to incorporate new climate change vulnerability assessments in, in those master plan updates. Next slide, please. On the New York City front, it's been a busy year. Earlier this year, the Rice Resilience Coalition was also uh, out front in terms of supporting climate design guidelines legislation. Uh, this is an important bill that really impacts how things are going to be built. All city funded infrastructure and buildings in every neighborhood will have to adhere to the city's climate resiliency design guidelines. 
We're seeing that this legislation is actually serving as a model for other municipalities. Um, similarly, we were active as a coalition in influencing the city budget um, and ensuring that the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate Resilience receives long-term funding. Um, and as a coalition, we continue to work on comprehensive planning uh, in the city of New York to focus more extensively on climate resilience. I should add that it's an important year. It's an election year. There's a new mayoral administration coming in, a large turnover in the city council. Uh, and as a coalition, we've been very vocal in terms of engaging with candidates, especially um, the next mayoral administration with the platform and candidate engagement. And there'll be more to come on that front in the coming months uh, as the general election nears. Next slide, please. Um, at the New York state level, in progress now are two really important um, uh, legislative uh, pieces. The Environmental Bond Act, uh, which will be a funding stream for uh, climate resilience and water quality um, uh, infrastructure and, and natural resources. This will be a ballot referendum in November of 2022, and we will be working extensively with other partners in the environmental advocacy space to encourage the public to vote yes on the Bond Act. Uh, and similarly, the uh, New York State Senate passed flood disclosure legislation last year that was influenced by this coalition's advocacy. Uh, the assembly did not adopt the bill, so we will be actively undertaking this again. And this is a really important piece of legislation uh, post uh, Hurricane Ida. Um, some states do have flood disclosure legislation for uh, individuals selling their homes. New York State and New Jersey currently do not. Uh, next slide, please. And again, just to hone in on our near-term priorities moving ahead, I mentioned the flood disclosure legislation, uh, which this coalition will be actively undertaking, um, concrete recommendations and commitments for the first 100 days of the upcoming New York City mayoral administration, um, and looking at federal policy very closely with our, um, with our partners in the coalition who are active in Washington, um, trying to influence Army Corps funding and reform and state revolving loan funds to support local infrastructure. Um, with that, uh, next slide, I will turn it back to Courtney. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So thank you, Karen. Th thank you, Dr. Kaman. And um, I hope that what you've gotten from this is just the, this arc of, of, of the importance of systems and the importance of how we need to work together, but also examples specifically of the ways that people can get involved with making sure that their individual actions are connected to a larger agenda, which is focused on changing our systems at one, at one level or another. So with that, um, I'm gonna uh, open it up for questions and um, I believe everyone should be <clears throat> unmuted or shortly will be unmuted. And um, you can raise your hand to ask questions or um, put them in the chat and we'll call on you. Do you have any, any, any questions for any of the speakers? Okay, so um, we have one question in the chat. Oh, Nat, go ahead. Were you gonna say something? Yeah, I see that Emmeline Coster, you raised your hand. Oh. So I will be sharing the permission so that you can pose your question to our panelists. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, Emlyn Costa from Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm a former board member of the Alliance and uh, was pleased back in 2009 to co-host with the Alliance the H209 Forum with the Dutch on the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson, uh, encountering a pristine estuary in 1609. I, I applaud this uh, much broader look at uh, issues that the Alliance and the greater New York area needs to confront. And, and my sort of comment leading to a question, particularly of the Columbia colleague, um, is that I guess um, the New York area faces three um, a higher water level issues. Uh, Sandy uh, showed that a sub-hurricane level storm surge pushed water inland, you know, causing $60 billion of damage further than anybody ever thought possible. And it wasn't even a hurricane, uh, but the trajectory of the storm was perfect, um, so-called. And then Ida shows that um, irrespective of storm surge, that the city, the land part of the city uh, could not cope in, in many respects with a, uh, a seven inch rainfall uh, with record intensity per hour 
what what's not being discussed and and Courtney and I have had chats about this over the years is that there's a third flank I submit uh, to the resiliency argument and that's the one that's probably impossible to adequately discuss but I suggest that it must be kept on the radar screen and that is that all that we heard about from the global situation in the first talk by Colombia is a worldwide issue and that is that uh, uh, the warming of the ocean and the melting of ice sheets and glacier ice is raising sea level worldwide. And even if one takes the lowest uh, worldwide sea level rise by the end of the 21st century, it uh, portends uh, another kind of disaster for anywhere, uh, and the New York area is our focus, with uh, the low-lying areas around the waterfront, both in New Jersey and New York, being inundated uh, permanently and increasingly. So I want to ask if if there is any if this talk this morning and these conversations raise the specter that the resilience discussion for the information of, of the stakeholders must begin to include the unspeakable, which is the uh, not just the resilience, but the unlivability, if I can use that word, of the coastal areas of the New York, New Jersey metro region. Come on, do you want to want to tackle that first, and then I can go? Sure. I mean, I'm not a I'm not an expert on sea level rise and stuff like that, but something particular to New York that I've been really surprised at is there is a huge number. Like there are 14 wastewater treatment plants, all of them on the water. They have to be, and the number of power plants all on the water. They don't have to be. It's the only city I've ever lived in. Like the UK got rid of power plants in cities in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. There hasn't been a power plant built in a city in how long? And I'm really surprised every time I look at New York, how much of the essential infrastructure, never mind the livability, how much of the essential infrastructure to keep the city running is right on the water. So I, there hasn't been investment in those. I don't know how resilient they are going to be, but if you are like, if you're worried about sea level rise, there's an awful lot of the essential function to keep people healthy and alive that is right on the water. And that was for Ida, how much of it, like there was a lot of discussion, which was kind of disgusting about all the rats that ended up getting washed out to sea. But all of that went through the sewage system because the, the water, you want the street water to go through the sewer system rather than dumping it straight out to the waterfront itself. But that also means that those wastewater treatment plants are now completely overwhelmed. Nothing is getting filtered. So I think you've got a really good point, but we can't just think about like the sea coming up. I guess thinking about the infrastructure of the what's essential to keep living healthily. And I think the wastewater treatment plants often get left out of that discussion. And New York in particular, the power plants. I, I mean, I, some of them are barges on the river, maybe they'll float. But like the fact that there's so much combustion in the core of the city that's essential to keep it running, and I'm not sure it's ever, it was never designed, but there's never been an, there hasn't been any investment in updating any of that technology. If there was, they wouldn't be in the city center where they're killing thousands of people a year from air quality. So I guess that's my, from the air quality perspective, I fully agree with you. And I think we need to get them out of there, to be honest. Don't know where they go. Don't know if there's a proper infrastructure for getting energy into the city but I would really prefer people not to be breathing the, the emissions from them. I'll just add <clears throat> that um, offshore wind is one answer to some of this, um, though there need to be backups for offshore wind. Um, and as the capacity for battery storage increases, I think that will change the equation in terms of what type of power facilities are still needed in the city um, to support the variability of Go ahead. Were you going to say so something? My only worry is that we take the infrastructure that's there and put batteries there. Those locations yeah. are not ideal if we're going to be thinking about 50 years time. And that's, I think there's a lot of, oh, it'll be cheap. We'll just put it there. There needs to be some thinking about that as well. Um, that yes, I think the technology is coming, but maybe certain things we wouldn't have thought of need to start being considered and sea level rise and flooding from the inside out. I mean, maybe our, some of the huge amounts of methane coming from New York City are coming from the sewer system. Is there a way to start decoupling the sewer system from the floodwaters? 
that's a huge investment that nobody's going to make. So how do we deal with the the deal with that other than trying to redesign the entire system? Could I just add back a comment, please? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate the answers, and uh, I would agree that maybe a first order priority in this longer third kind of water level rise issue is to start to start to it's a difficult uh, challenging maybe impossibly to consider question but what the first speaker i'm sorry i haven't remembered her name yet from colombia but you've got to start to uh, move away from from the water's edge from not just the water's edge but low lying water edge that's what matters the elevation not the distance uh, the infrastructure that is key uh, but i'd also say that new residential and office construction in low-lying water edge locations i'm familiar for example with the american copper building on the east uh, side just south of the un which is one of i guess a growing many buildings which are actively pushing their key infrastructure within the services of the building utilities up many floors so they can't get wet during a sandy type event so that kind of resilience measure, which I don't see being mentioned, and the um, starting to actively uh, move key energy infrastructure, like has been mentioned, uh, to higher elevations, are two first steps which would carry a massive message to the longer term, bigger scale necessities of higher global sea level, which is going to have its own effect on the New York area, just like every other area more so in subsiding areas uh, like New Orleans or Sacramento or Florida. But at least the New York area doesn't have the double whammy problem of being a sinking land. I think the sea level, the land level rise since the ice melted is minimal. Uh, the land level rise is minimal in the New York area. Yeah, if I could just add one quick comment on that is to, to look at, at two things that the city is doing along those very lines. And that is the legislation that was adopted in the city earlier this year on codifying the city's climate design guidelines, which means that all city owned infrastructure, right? So it's not yet applying to private development, but city owned infrastructure is going to have to do many of the things that you're describing in the floodplain, elevate mechanical setback, uh, create different first floor structures uh, and put different utilities uh, positioned in different places. This is a first indicator of some of what you're describing um, similarly, for, for homeowners, um, uh, there was a zoning change. And this is why this is a complicated landscape, because certain things are legislated, certain things are zoning. There's a zoning change adopted called Zoning for Coastal Flood Resiliency, which is voluntary. It's not mandated, but what it does is allow individual homeowners and, and small buildings to make some of the changes you're describing. So these are, these are smaller steps that, that, frankly, should be codified or incentivized in bigger ways because for an individual homeowner to make some of these retrofits um, is very expensive. And also the education out there about what, what this entails. Um, so this is an, an important, I think, step that the city should be taking, thinking bigger about building retrofits. There's also the bigger question about um, continuing to build in certain communities at all. And, and what we see is that in New Jersey, for example, there's a program called Blue Acres that has helped homeowners to actually relocate out of certain shorefront communities. It's a, it's a difficult question in a very dense environment like New York City, because if we're relocating, we have to think about where else are we building to accommodate the move. But certainly these conversations are being had more often now than, than before, because there are communities in, in Southeast Queens and in Staten Island that are indeed seeing regular flooding um, throughout the month when the, when the tides are high, sunny day flooding. And, and the possibility of continuing to rebuild homes or apartments there is, is becoming um, much more challenging. Thanks for that detailed answer, Karen. That's great. Sure. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Emlyn. I'm going to see another raised hand coming in from Dr. Edward Williams. So Edward, feel free to pose your question. You are now unmuted. very interesting conversation this morning because recently I was part of a uh, update discussion that was uh, um, facilitated by the borough president here in southeastern Queens and in the discussion there were basically updates to talk about projects that have been in the pipeline for about 25 years 
as far as I'm concerned, and has now brought to bear the discussion because of the impact of Hurricane Ida here in Southeastern Queens. None of that conversation included anything relative to the impact of uh, the, the planes situation that we have going over in our neighborhoods and communities. Some of us live in the landing and takeoff pattern from JFK. And so the air quality in the community is very challenging, especially for folks that have underlying respiratory conditions. What I found uh, missing from that conversation as well is the immediate uh, um, recommendations of how to address the, the long years of unintention of projects that would, that would meet the challenge not only of sea level rise, but something that they were not prepared for that had to do with the amount of rain that, uh, that Irene brought uh, to Southeastern Queens. And so I, I am, my organization obviously is, is uh, very excited and thankful to be part of a discussion on the city level of how the city council, Matter of fact, all, th all three disciplines of government, the federal government, the state, and the city will now begin to try to address these challenges and how our advocacy can be enhanced by the information that we receive and the dialogue that we get from these type of, uh, of opportunities, such as this morning, will help us to move not only the conversation, but perhaps move those disciplines of government in terms of how they respond to their constituency. And one last thing, the, as we talk about plans and what the things that should be done before 2050, 2030, 20, what you find in advocacy in the community is that, the membership and the constituency, their concern is what are we doing to move those recommendations uh, beyond not, uh, in 2021, 2022, and, and thereafter until we reach 2050, if we're still around to do it. Oh. Okay. Dr. Williams, thank you so much. And I, I think what I would I would respond um, to to your to your points is that one of the roles of organizations like the Waterfront Alliance and and the Rise to Resilience Coalition is to make sure that all of these uh, dispersed initiatives within the city are integrated by advocacy, the advocacy community and the policy community, so that we are addressing multiple threats at one time. Um, either through uh, a policy the city is moving forward or a work that the, the city is doing with a particular community. And so the most holistic solutions, I think, need to come of two communities and the different departments and agencies in the city that sometimes don't talk to each other and are coordinated is, um, is the challenge and the role of advocacy organizations and community groups and homeowners associations is to work together to make sure that as many of these many different goals and needs are integrated into comprehensive policy. And so I, I would say, um, you know, the Waterfront Alliance is um, spearheading the Rice Resili Resilience Coalition definitely works for that. One aspect of this though, that I think all New Yorkers should pay attention to is the push for comprehensive planning in, in New York City. There was um, legislation uh, introduced by Speaker City Council Speaker Corey Johnson um, earlier this year. And the effort is to make sure that the city can plan for the future. The focus 
in the most, for the most part, the focus for that legislation had to do with affordable housing and making sure that the city can meet the demands of all residents. And it is critical for the Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition to integrate climate resili resilience and also climate emissions um, reductions within that conversation. So there's a lot of work to be done on that legislation, but I would say um, that is one aspect where these things all need, need to come together. So I'm sorry, I don't have a specific answer for you though about, about the, um, the area of near JFK, but I, I guess that's my one of over, overview of, of where we need to go, especially as advocates and within the advocacy, advocacy community. Well, okay, let me just ask one final question. In the discussion uh, that I was part of uh, that was um, chaired by uh, Borough President uh, Donovan Richards. He had three agencies involved in that conversation. The Department, the Department of uh, Environmental Co Conservation. Um, he had Department of Transportation. And I think it was uh, Department of Construction and Design. And in that conversation, um, they basically spoke about projects that were in the pipeline to address the challenges that the rainfall brought about in Southeastern Queens. So there was a, my, my question is, and they were talking about planning, but is there a, 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 a plan that includes all five boroughs uh, in terms of the resiliency and things of that nature that we are aware of as being maybe uh, offered by uh, Speaker uh, Johnson? Is there is there anything in the pipeline like that you know of? Yeah, oh, well, one thing is that the, and, and then we'll move on to the next question, but, uh, and, and Dr. Williams, please be, please get in touch with us afterwards if you want more information, but one of the things that we're working on very strongly right now is to make sure that the next mayor of New York City commits to a climate resiliency plan or roadmap or comprehensive planning one way or another. So I think it really, it really is important that the next mayor take this up as, 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 his, um, as his priority for the future of the city for ensuring that um, our communities still can thrive and, and survive through all these challenges. So um, I'll just make a pitch to make sure to pay attention to all that's coming through on the Rise Resilience Coalition, especially, and I, I know um, we've been in touch with so many of the coalition members and thank you to so many coalition members who have participated in the work that we did to create the 100 day plan for the next mayor for New York City and more to come. Uh, there are many more days than 100 within the next administration. And so I think we're gonna be working um, throughout, um, you know, throughout the, the term of the next mayor because there is no time that, that the city has ever faced like this time. And so um, the, the integration of all of this work and the participation and the strength of the Rice Resilience Coalition is just absolutely critical. So, so now, do we have any more um, raised hands? I do not see any more raised hands. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to hit the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen or pop your questions into the chat. Um, we have a few minutes left. I think we have questions. one minute left. Oh, That's one minute left. Yeah, so it oh, Karen, there go is ahead. A question, there is a question in the chat uh, from oh, Adina great. Taylor. How are our colleges training students on issues such as location policy for infrastructure with emissions and geography of critical importance. Um, and uh, I guess the question is on uh, overall um, education, maybe at the at the student level and beyond. Um, it, it's it, I guess we have a, a minute or two left and I, I can sort of take a crack at it, but it's a big question. Um, Climate science uh, at, at, at sort of the school's you know STEM level has has a long way to go. Um, climate education and how it's incorporated in, into the DOE again has a long way to go. We have a program at Waterfront Alliance called Estuary Explorers that does um, teach climate resilience and waterfront estuary uh, information to students in the public school system. But th this whole space. Um, 
in terms of the jobs that it that, that it can offer across different um, spectrums is is a I think a growing opportunity. Um, but I think many students, whether at the at the public school level or beyond in the CUNY SUNY system, uh, really may not know the career paths uh, available to them. Um, and I think it's you know incumbent upon uh, the advocacy community, environmental advocacy community, working with the workforce development community, working with the um, the schools and colleges to ensure that pathways to opportunities um, do exist, because I think this ties back to increasingly things that um, were mentioned earlier about offshore wind, renewables, green retrofits. Um, there will be jobs in this pipeline, um, but the kind of pathways of opportunity, I think, still have um, a ways to go uh, in terms of being developed. Okay, and with that, we're going to wrap it up. Dr. Coman, do you have any final words before before we wrap up? No, but thank you for the invitation because COVID really point got home to me how uh, any one person isn't going to make a difference unless we start working together. So thank you for everyone's work on advocating for various things. So. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this. And I know this is the busy, one of the busiest weeks of the year. So we are extremely lucky to Man. have you Dr. Cohen. Yeah, so uh, wonderful. I hope we can, um, we can, yeah, we just have a comment here. Let's do this more often, agreed. <laughs> um, and just all my thanks to Columbia University for its commitment to participation in these types of events, which uh, I think are just going to become more and more important over time. So thank you all so much for joining and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.